Hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Severson, co-founder and president of Water Tower Research and head of sustainable investing research. Um, I'm glad everybody could make it today. This is our inaugural um, climate tech investor conference, and we look forward to having many more of these in the future. It's a great opportunity to get companies in front of investors and so much going on in clean tech these days. It's a, it's a great topic and glad everybody could make it today. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking the team from the OTC, Matt, uh, Matt LaTeplo, Teplo, uh, John Vignati, Jenny Steele, and Jessette Oltman. Also like to thank our sponsors today, Lukoski Brookman, Joe Lukoski, and Maria Finnis are here today, Freedom Capital Markets. We have Rob, John, uh, Alex, Catherine, and Trish today. They'll be coming in and out, so hopefully you'll get a chance to meet them. Um, and our royalties, of course, Bernard, Talia, and Bryce. Um, as a reminder, we did an event with uh, – co-hosted an event with them in Toronto earlier this year that was great success as well. Um, as a reminder, presenters should go into the green room, uh, which is located behind you where you're doing your remarks 10 minutes prior to their presentation time. And I'd like to introduce uh, Eric from the OTC and uh, let companies know to find him if he needs, uh, if they need any help or uh, anything else, any questions, please reach out to him during the day today. And so I think we're supposed to stand up and Make sure everybody yeah <laughs> so they so know know who to go after um for anyone that like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one in person today as a reminder you can reach out to tim uh kathy walton or ted tedla and we'll get one set up for you uh, we will have a lunch panel today the topic is going to be looking at climate investing in 2024 and beyond and that will be starting at 12 15 uh 12 15 p.m as a reminder the one-on-one room by one on one room by the way is behind you uh, back there for your meetings so take note there and with that I guess we'll go ahead and start the first uh, first presenter right at nine o'clock uh, first presenter today is going to be Tico 2030 ASA uh, this is a presentation from Tor Anger Chief Executive Officer of Tico 2030 ASA which trades on the OTCQX market under the symbol TECFF as well as on the Oslo OSE under the symbol TECO. And with that, I'll turn it over to you and uh, you can go ahead, Tor. I guess I start this for you to get your comment. Um, thank you very much for coming. And uh, also great welcome to everybody who is uh, participating uh, on, on, on Teams. Today, I'm going to try to take you through what we are doing. If uh, uh, I pull here or... Yep. All right. This is what we are producing. And I would just like to try to explain very briefly what this is. This is a fuel cell module. This is the next generation of an engine or power generators where we are changing from gasoline or diesel to hydrogen as a fuel. Very simple, this is the engine of tomorrow. And we have a huge problem in front of us regarding emission. This is how a typically power generator looks like. You change that with today's diesel generator and you have a hydrogen generator with a hydrogen tank next to it. This is basically what we are looking at. These five guys on top are the worst polluter in the world. Trucking industry, the airlines, heavy industry, shipping and locomotive. And here we are put up to do something because I hope that everybody is not keen on putting on that COVID mask again and we have to do our very best for the next generations to come make the world a nice place to live fuel cell power generated compared to a diesel generated pollution environment environmental impact here you have no emission at all this is warm water and air that is the emission it's absolutely zero emission. In our industry, which is basically where we are coming from, we have some ambitious goals made up by AIMO, the International Maritime Organization. Today, you have about 
100,000 vessels on the seven seas. 25,000 is here on the waterways in the US, 15 is in Europe on the waterways, and 60,000 ships is deep sea shipping. Another two, 3,000 ships is coming every year to the market, and just a few 800 is scrapped on a yearly basis. From 2014 until 2050, the, 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 the vessel which is going to be built is going to triple from what it is today. And this is super serious. And on top of all these 100,000 ships, Yangtze River in China is having 100,000 vessels alone. And 90% of all goods transported today, it's taking place by ships. This is our fuel cell opportunities. Maritime and heavy duty applications, stationary power, mobility hydrogen, and we can also offer license agreement for countries which we have no plan to enter into. This is, if you, if you look into the fact that, think about how many engine designers do you find in the world today? Is it 5,000? Is it 10,000? Or is it 100,000? I don't know, it's, it's a lot. This is tomorrow's engine. And so far there is six, seven, eight, maybe 10 players in the market. Very few of them is doing a pure play towards a target. We are going to produce one stack and one unit and hopefully many hundred thousands. One of these units which I've uh, showed you on the first page is 400 kilowatt, equivalent to 535 horsepower. And this is a stacking system. Do you need 535 horsepower or do you need 53,500? It's just a matter of how many of these units do you need? It's a stacking system. We have on the top six photos, it's definitely a full module from us. On the two, uh, on line number three, the mining equipment and the locomotive is also a full unit. And towards aviation and trucking, we will be a stack supplier. Stack is what we have to the left. And the stack is the heart of the fuel cell. 60, 70% of the values is created there. So think about all these markets. It's enormous. Think about zero emission in New York. How many hundred thousand diesel generators do you have to change? I have no clue, but it's many. <clears throat> Our development timeline, which we made uh, some time ago, looks like this. We started our project in the fourth quarter of 2020. We had a plan that within one year, we should have an approval in principle from a class society. And we have, of course, gone with DNV, which is one of the biggest in the world, and Norwegian and very strict. We had a plan that after two years, we should produce our first stack, which we did. And on the fourth quarter of this year, the plan was to get our unit into the test bed in Austria, which, is, which took place two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So you see the photo of me over there together with Professor List, that is the owner of AVL, which is our development partner. And I will get back to that shortly. What is next? Next summer, we are putting our first hydrogen container into physical work. Implenia is one of the biggest construction companies in Europe, a Swiss-based company. We are working with the Norwegian legal entity. These guys are only doing big things, big in, building roads, bridges, tunnels, and so on. These guys is going to showcase that they can operate a construction site on zero emission. Today, they have a lot of electric equipment, but you know, it doesn't help when you have to charge the battery on diesel. So next is to charge the battery on hydrogen. End of 2024, beginning of 2025, we will finish uh, the biggest retrofit project on a ship ever taken place so far. A 2.4 megawatt or equivalent to a little bit more than 3000 horsepower will make that old 17 years old bitumen carrier, the worst in the fleet, to be the best in the fleet. Zero emission operation, at least in port, during her whole operation, 
she will lower her emission with 65%, which is quite good. Then we have a plan next uh, beginning of 2025. We will go into automated stack production. That means robotics. And second half of 2025, we will go into mass production of the module, which will be based on the same type of production as a car is produced today. It's called semi-automated. Development partners, it's a criteria for success. We are working with other people's money, so we are doing absolutely everything we can to avoid as much risk as possible. AVL in Austria is the biggest independent developer of powertrain during the past 75 years. More than 1,500 engines has been designed by AVL, and I'm pretty sure that all the cars you are driving have some kind of technology from AVL. AVL is working for all the big OEMs. Biggest client is typically Volkswagen with all brands. Here in the US, plenty of them. Ford, they are working with everybody. 11,000 people employed, and they are developing for about 2 billion euro on a, on a yearly basis. 10% out of their turnover is going back into R&D because AVL is always going to be two, three, four, five years ahead of the market. They are looking into the, to the, to the, to the macro, not into the micro. So what is, what is hot in 2028 is already ongoing within the AVL system. We would never have been where we are today so fast without these guys. 60 people from AVL, 40 guys from us, has been working on this project for three years. More than half a million man hour has been put behind. And finally, three week, two weeks ago, we started up in, in, in uh, Austria. So we have people now coming into Graz every day to really physically see the product, look at the tests, meeting all the people from our side and also from AVL. Vision Group, another major company in the world, German company, almost 100,000 people employed. Tyson Group is one of the biggest companies in the world when it comes to production line. So we have, again, since we are working with other people's money, we don't want to take risk. So we have joined up with the best of the best, maybe not the cheapest, but the safest. So Tyson Group is going to deliver the cell production system, the stacking system, assembly, and the test bench. Lighthouse projects, we have already been uh, through two of them. Uh, the, 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 this project with, um, uh, to the left, the tanker, we got 5 million euro in support from EU Horizon. We got $5 million in response from Shell to prove this, because of course today we are on a prototype level. It costs a fortune to produce a unit. It's all about getting up to economy of scale. That's why I'm saying that we are a pure fuel cell play. We don't want to do high low and, and, and um, um, high and low PEM fuel cells. We do one of them. We are not going to do electrolyzer. We are not going to do SOFC or SOEC. This is a pure play where we have one target. I don't believe that you're going to win if you have 10 targets. If you have one, you either lose or win. But if you have 10, it's, very, it's not easy. And you can see that today. Too many companies do too many things in what we are doing. The, the, the project in the middle is a 63,000 deadweight ton bulk carrier, which is going to freight copper between Chile and China with a fully powered vessel on PEM fuel cells. This will be on ammonia with an ammonia cracker into hydrogen and into a 12 megawatt system. This delivery <laughs> represents 23 million euro per ship. So we are talking um, big figures when we are just getting there. This, uh, the company is now working heavily on the financing, but we are pretty sure that these guys will be successful. Why hydrogen fuel cells? First of all, that's the only feasible way today to obtain zero emission. And it's the most efficient way to store a synthetic fuel and then use it as electricity. Later on, you will very soon see that local rules and regulations is coming up, 
and carbon tax is coming, so you wouldn't believe crazy amount is going to cost the guys who is not going to be a part and change the world. And again, it's of course all about the Paris Agreement. Why our fuel cell? This is the most powerful fuel cell module ever made in the world so far. With absolutely the best of the best, class leading lifetime target, designed for many various applications, and it's, it's, it's designed for going into mass production. This unit is about 2 meter 20 high or 7 feet, 1.4 meter wide and 70 centimeter deep. So then you have basically an ID about the size. Our fuel cells has gone through already more than 3,000 hours in the test bank, test bench. We are using unique carbon by polar plates, for cell and stacking system, specially made for heavy duty. Let me tell you one thing. All the other guys in the world, they have developed fuel cells with the mindset of something rolling on four wheels. This is about electricity. When you are rolling on four wheels, you have a 10 centimeter rubber as isolation. When you're doing this towards heavy duty industry on board a vessel or on a locomotive, it's steel to steel. It's two completely different things. So in the landscape today, there is three other companies, which, is, which we are meeting out in the market all the time. And they are in front of us because they have already had the product for some years. But they are, all of them is coming from real mindset thinking to take it from there and make it ready for maritime use. It's a huge job, big, and it's a lot of challenges. Where are we coming from? We are building on 30 years of experience. Tico Maritime Group is turning 30 years next month. We have been in the market since January 1994. We are already uh, supplying and supporting three, four, five thousand ships on a yearly basis. So we had a plan when we started our project that within 22, 23, when people in the marine industry is talking about fuel cells, they should talk about Tico 2030, which they do. We made a spin-off in 2019, created Tico 2030 as a legal entity, and we took the company public in October 2020. But we are very familiar. Today we are talking with many of these logos you see down there, are we talking with today in regards to, 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 to fuel cells. We are a Euronext uh, listed Norwegian public company, also traded here on the OTC. We are at present roughly 60 people uh, employed and growing. We have roughly a market cap in the range of 90 million. 60 million has been raised in 30 million in equity, 10 million in a convertible bond loan, and we have received 20, more or less 20 million dollars in grants from Shell, Innovation Norway, Horizon Europe, the Research Council of Norway, and ENOVA, which is another government arm. We are, at the, for the time being, not working on 85 active fuel cells at past 100. The slide has not been updated. We are working with projects from, from Australia, Singapore, Japan, a lot here in the US, all over Europe, South America. We are working on projects all over the world every day. Latest news and market opportunities. This is from the opening session in, uh, in, in Graz a couple of weeks back, where we had uh, a lot of people attending. Uh, amongst them, we had our, yeah, just to tell you. We have one of these units. During 35 hours of operation, you are saving 900,000 uh, 900, tons of CO2. 90. Never mind. 1,000 units, 9.2 million tons of CO2 reduction. When we go on full speed in 2030, with the capacity we are planning today, we are talking about 37 million tons of CO2 not released. That's the same as Rotterdam is doing, Berlin, Toronto, and Yokohama. Yokogawa is just entered into us as a strategic partner, and they also invested 
uh, a small amount of money as a sort of a starting point. I think they used six, seven months on due diligence. I think they have turned every paper we have upside down, inside out, 100 times. They have been a few times to Oslo. They have been to our factory in uh, the northern part of Norway. They have been to Graz. And last week, we had seven of them. Two weeks ago, we had, had a team of seven in Oslo, in Narvik, and also in Graz. So for us to get a major player as Yokogawa on board as a shareholder and strategic partner, that means a lot. Because the Japanese, they are doing the homework before they are putting money on the table. Market, it's just enormous. I just said that in 2030, we will be able to do 50 gig, 1.6 gigawatt. Here, Citigroup and McKinsey is saying that in 2030, they expect the demand to be 50 gigawatt and growing rapidly. You can see that McKinsey is not as bent forward as Citigroup, but nevertheless, the market is just going to be enormous big. Enormous big. Fuel cells is definitely a part of the future. Here now, you have the seven and a half billion splash already from the Biden administration to seven various hubs to really speed up the production of hydrogen, including infrastructure. And we are definitely hanging in there with, um, with Mid-Atlantic hydrogen hub all the way to the right. Many other things is ongoing. Right now, there is COP28 ongoing in Dubai, where they are talking about emission, 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 emission for two weeks. So let's see what comes out of that meeting when, when, when they are ready. Here again, our system, very fuel flexible. I can see that I'm running out of time. Very fuel flexible. We can do everything, take on board everything, all kinds of hydrogen, methanol, ammonia. Ongoing projects we have been through. Here is some, uh, some others we are working on. We have just finished a big feasibility study for a big locomotive producer. We are working with a lot of ship owners and we are in contract modus every day. A lot of our potential clients has been waiting to see the first unit and physically can touch it. Everybody believe in us because we have the right partners. We have the right setup. We know the market we are into. Factory in Arvik. 165,000 square feet, half of it is clean room standard. It was built by the Norwegian government in 2008 for solar production, a company called Rexolar. That company was bought up in 2012 and production was moved to Singapore and China. Today, the company is owned by Reliance in India, which is one of the biggest players in India. Building has been idle, but maintained very well by the Norwegian government for eight years until we came in and took over in 2021. We have a 15 plus 10 year lease agreement and we have a purchase option to buy the building, which we can buy anytime. Today, uh, the cost of that building to build it new would be 38 million euro. It cost 28 when it was built in 2008. Building has been idle for eight years, so we have an option to buy it for 6 million. Here is the plan um, Thyssen Group has made for the whole thing. This is all the way up to 1600 megawatt or 1.6 gigawatt on a two shift basis. So we can go from two shifts per day to what they call five and six, means that we are operating seven days per week, 365. So we can most likely with the same uh, equipment, double it to 3.2. This is just to show the interest for what we are doing. This is growing every day. It's a very nice interest of increasement we see absolutely every day. Today, we have quotes out for almost 1.4 billion euro. I have no idea how much of those 1.4 is coming in as contracts, but it's definitely some of them. This is again uh, hypothetical how this could look like, but with a 400 megawatt production in 2025, we should be able to obtain um, economy of scale, we should be able to have an EBITDA, uh, which is quite nice on 18%. Don't have to look at that because everybody knows that all guys in the uh, market is back to 2020 level and everybody has been over the Eiffel Tower in between.
It has been a super hype, nothing else. We saw it in 20, in 2000 on the dot com. We have seen it now. So now all the guys in the industry have to sober up and start to deliver. Those days is over. We have a standby equity distribution agreement. So we can print, we can deliver shares tomorrow. We can do private placements all the time. So we are, we are prepared to do that. And we are doing it. We have done, just recently done a couple of million dollars. Prime partners, shareholder. We are, I think, very few companies which has been alive for three years and already delivered three full ESG reports. We are very into that. We are getting a lot of support from KPMG. Our team, three of us is here today. Fantastic people. Thank you very much. Tori, thank you. Um, we're going to take some time for some questions now. I would ask for you to wait for the microphone. Questions, anyone? Thanks. So I was talking about the commercialization in the shipping market in particular. Is that going to be driven by the, not necessarily the shipping companies, but the goods, the, the goods that are being shipped, right? So let's say they're looking at reducing their CI score and their supply chain. So would that be how you envision this rolling out with, is through this being driven by the companies that are contracting with the shipping companies? That's absolutely one of the drivers. Let's say that Amazon, Ikea, Coca-Cola, all these guys, they are looking into vessels with zero emission. It's all about obtaining as less emission as possible all the way, the whole lifespan time. And, and on top of that, it will be driven by IMO, International Maritime Organization, which is just under the United Nations. It will be driven by flag state, local rules and regulations. Oslo are planning zero emission in 2027. How they are going to do that, I have no idea. Rotterdam, which is one of the biggest ports in the world, are planning zero emission in 2030, if not earlier. So it has to start now because this is not happening overnight. Anyone else? Uh, you mentioned the uh, hydrogen hubs in the US. Are similar programs going on around the world and other major shipping ports? It's going around absolutely all over. And it's, it's popping up new information every day. Just last week, Germany announced a 20 billion euro investment in upgrading of 9,700 kilometers of pipes so they could be fitted for transport hydrogen starting already in 2025. As an example, it's, it's happening all over. Yeah, my question is similar to the first two, but you mentioned the local regulations driving emission reduction. Curious, you know, are you seeing quicker adoption in certain geographies or some of the industries you plan on service? Just curious, kind of what's the biggest sort of opportunity you see around the world in terms of, you know, where Tico 2030 could win the quickest? I think that what we can see that we are not looking into retrofitting ships on a full propulsion. But if let's say that a, a, a huge container vessel, they can put up 3.2 megawatt of fuel cells and they can do the last hour in. They can stay the day and the first hour out again on zero emission. And this is very important. 90% of the population of the world live along the coastline. 90% of that again is in cities and the cities have to be zero emission as soon as possible. So we think that it's a huge market for us to put on board additional equipment to make the ship better when it comes to emission. Hey, we, we have uh, some questions from our online audience. Uh, just combine, we have a couple investors asking for guidance for 2024. If you can speak to revenue or backlog. I think that it's time to everybody to understand that we are still a developing company. We are burning money every week, every month. We are developing. We will definitely have a nice backlog building up during 2024. But we are not aiming for a huge turnover. But we might sign contracts for 50, 100, 150 million dollars. But this again will be then delivery, some in late 24, 25, 26, and onwards. We are waiting for the explosion in demand. You can see it now on the trekking side in the world. And soon is also coming our, our way. And we could also be a stack supplier to the truck industry. So I'm, I'm not going to say anything about what we expect in 2024, but I think that you're going to see uh, um, quite nice turnover already in 2025. 
All right, Tori, I think uh, I think that's it for today. Uh, I appreciate your time. As a reminder, if anyone wants to meet with him one-on-one, -on -one, uh, please contact him outside to get on the one-on-one -on -one schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shit. <laughs> Simple as <is> that, huh? <laughs> Great, uh, thank you. And our next presentation, we have Loop Industries. Uh, this is going to be Kevin O'Dowd, uh, Vice President of Communications and Investor Relations at Loop Industry, which trades on the NASDAQ under the symbol LOOP. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Kevin. And uh, go ahead. Yeah, as Sean said, he ruined my intro. I'll give him my name again. I'm proud. I'm <laughs> head of communications and IR at Loop Industries. It's great to be here in New York at Christmas time. I spent the last two days in uh, Florida. It's felt a little, it seemed like it was a little sacrilegious being down there in December. But uh, I'm from Boston, and I'm excited to be here today to share with you the uh, progress and plans of our company. Give you a little background. Loop was founded back in 2014. We've invested upwards of $150 million developing, refining our technology, gone from lab scale, pilot scale, demonstration scale, to having a commercial production facility just outside of Montreal and Terrebonne, Quebec. We're launching broad scale commercialization of our technology with world class partners. We're expanding in the Asian market with uh, SK Group, a sustainability giant who in June of 2021 took a 10% ownership stake in Loop. Uh, and then two weeks ago, we broke ground on this faci facility in Alsan, South Korea. Mm -hmm. Very exciting project for us. Right behind that is our partnership with Suez, large French water waste management company in uh, France uh, for our European facility in saint Old France. So we'll put up the slide deck now, walk you through the presentation, then we can leave some time for questions at the end. Huge global plastic waste problem. I think everybody knows about this. A tremendous need for more recycling, more recycled content. Loops technology is the perfect fit to help with the PET and polyester fiber segments. PET plastic, number one, use plastic for packaging, polyester fiber, clothing, carpets. I don't think that gets spoken about enough. Wear a water bottle and a pair of my wife's Lululemon yoga shorts are made with the same base chemicals. 
they're equally polluted. And while that water bottle has become the symbol of pollution today, there's a lot more to this market than just water bottles. And that's key because Loop's technology is designed to handle all forms of pet plastic and polyester fiber waste. So what does Loop do? At the end of the day, we're a chemical manufacturer. We've developed a technology that we sell pet resin and polyester fiber back to the CPG companies, the beverage co companies, the food companies, apparel companies, anyone who uses pet plastic or polyester fiber for their packaging needs or their textile needs can be a customer. Our technology breaks down waste pet plastic and polyester fiber into their base chemical building blocks or monomers. One of those is dimethyl alteraphylate. The other one is monolethylene glycol. DMT starts off as crude oil. MEG starts off as nat, nat gas. They put together during polymerization to make pet plastic and then go on and make the final product. What we do is we pick the final product, the waste product. We break the molecular chain, release them in a singular form, and then we purify it back into a brand new piece of plastic. That's how we can take old polyester carpets, under Armour tops, my Nike Air Jordans, turn them into water bottles for customers or vice versa. Everything we produce is 100% recycled content, food grade plastic, certified by the FDA, Health Canada and the European regulators. Technology highlights. Over the last eight years, Loop has built out a technology that produces the highest quality, virgin quality pet resin and polyester fiber made from 100% recycled content. We don't blend it, it's 100% recycled, infinitely recycled. So now packaging and textiles can be recycled an infinite amount of time. There's no degradation quality. We remove all the colorings, all the additives, all the dyes, all the impurities. That's really what Loops technology is built to handle. That same package can be recycled over and over again, which is very important for our customers. We're the only company that can go bottle to bottle, bottle to fiber, fiber to fiber, and fiber to bottle. No one else has that technology. And the key to the technology and our intellectual property is a low heat, no added de depolymerization process. Depolymerization has been around for 60 years. It was vented back in the 60s by Eastman. Um, it's never been commercially successful. Every attempt at depolymerization is always done at high temperature, somewhere between 260 and 300 degrees centigrade. To be able to break apart the plastic, and get to the molecular chain, Loops technology does that at 85 degrees Celsius. And that's key when you're talking about recycling because the incoming material to our process is basically garbage. And you're gonna have all different types of impurities in there. You're gonna have rocks, glass, ketchup, mustard, different type of paper, different type of plastic, buttons, zippers. And if you're using high heat or you're using high pressure, okay, you're going to get contamination. And that's key. That's what distinguishes Loops technology to anything that's ever been done before. Upcycling allows us to take very low value feedstock. All of the feedstock that comes into our process today, it has no value. It's either destined for landfill, incineration, or even worse yet, oceans or rivers. Food safe, safe, we have FDA, Health Canada, reach certification in Europe for food grade plastic, and we have over 200 patents around the world. How it works, we take the waste plastic on the left side, the bottles, carpet fibers, clothing, any type of material, really, we're agnostic to the input. As long as there's PET and polyester fiber in there, we're going to be able to get that down and break it out. We're going to get the DMT and, and break it down. Then once they're purified back into their purest forms, we can rebuild them into a brand new piece of plastic that can go into any final product. But it's really that second step that's really the key to where our technology with that low temperature process takes place. Addressable markets for pet poly and, and uh, consumption are huge. Pet packaging in 2022, you were talking about a $76 billion market growing at 4%. And that's just packaging. On the flip side, polyfiber, you're looking at about a $103 billion market. If you think about all the fabrics that are coming, uh, uh, running shoes, apparel, upholstery, home furnishings, all that supply chain exists in Asia. That's why our partnership with SK Geocentric is, is so important. 
Loop now can bring circularity to the clothing and textile industries. Working with companies like uh, Lululemon, Nike, Inditex to be able to bring circularity uh, for their plastic or polyfiber waste. Needless to say, there's a tremendous market for us in, the, in, in Asia. Government mandates driving demand. A lot of the demand for sustainability content is being driven by legislation and government mandates. Europe has basically declared war on petroleum-based products. They've introduced an EU plastics levy tax of 800 euros per ton uh, for plastics that can't be recycled. They have a 50% recycled content and packaging mandate by 2025. Canada has zero plastic waste by 2030, 50% recycled by 2030. Other countries around the world are doing similar. Our technology is a need to be able to help these companies uh, meet their targets and for the brand owners to achieve their commitments. There's tremendous pressure right now on the CPG companies to be able to get recycled content. And the key year is 2025. That's when a lot of these, these mandates kick in. So uh, we're helping. They, they want to be corporate citizens. They're getting in front of the mandates and we're helping them change the way they're thinking. So we're working lockstep with governments and the CPG companies, helping them achieve their, their goals. Feedstock sourcing, this is really where Loop has a tremendous advantage. Our technology allows for new pet waste streams to be recycled. Bottom line, a lot of the material that goes in our process, it can't be recycled today by everyone else. If you have a process using high heat, or high pressure or your mechanical recycling, you can't use the low value feedstock that the low quality feedstock that's perfect in loops process, i.e. opaque plastic, clamshells, ocean plastic, all the waste from the mechanical recycling industry, carpets, clothing, all that type of material can't be recycled efficiently. It works really well in our process. An example I like to use is Europe. A lot of these plastics, they sort them out of facilities. They have no home for them. Nobody wants them. They're destined for incineration. Incineration is very expensive, uh, creates a tremendous amount of CO2. There's an abundance of waste plastic out there today that's getting landfilled or incinerated that now can be diverted into loops process. And it's, it, this is the, the very exciting part of the business for me because it creates this entire new supply chain. We're working with companies like Suez in France, Veolia in Asia, and we're starting to get really deep into the su supply chain. This is our, our production facility in, in Terrebonne, Quebec. As, as I mentioned before, we've, we've built this thing out meticulously over the last uh, eight years. All of the design, all of the work comes from there. It's a scale production facility in industrial technology. You really have to take the time to build these things out properly. And that's what we've been able to do meticulously over the last eight years. Uh, going from pre-lab scale, lab scale, pilot scale, we've invested over $100 million in technology. We've optimized every piece of the equipment for efficiency, operability, de-risking the scale up. Uh, our partners, Suez and SK, have spent months at a time before they made, they made the decision to come in and partner with us. We operate this facility five days a week, uh, 12 hours a day. And I highly recommend for anybody who really wants to take a look at Loop to come up to Montreal uh, and visit with our facility. Loop brand activations. Loop is currently servicing over 25 companies out of our facility in Terrebonne, Quebec. On the left side of the slide, you can see the first commercially produced chemically recycled 100% recycled content bottle that's ever been available for sale. This bottle became available for sale in South Korea last year. It was the result of the, a partnership between Loop and Evian, which I think is the premier bottle, uh, uh, water bottle in the world. Um, I think it's worth noting that this is the first time any chemical recycle packages have been available for sale in the marketplace, not just Loop's technology, but any technology. And the, this was a very crucial milestone for us. And we're proud of the partnership with Evian. Also, this partnership with L'Occitane, L'Oreal, uh, Roger Federer is uh, on shoes. Um, and you'll see other partnerships uh, be announced in 2024. These are our manufacturing facilities. This is the Infinite Loop Maxery, uh, Manufacturing Design. 
This will be built in Asia. This is the same design that will be built in Europe with our partners, SK and Suez. It's the same equipment. It's the same design that's being leveraged for all of those facilities. It's a design one, build many. These are 70,000 ton per year capacity. We chose that capacity because we believe that today that's the perfect size to be able to build one of these in different countries around the world. If you go bigger than this, you'll be bringing in waste plastic from other places, other countries, and we strongly believe that in the future, plastic is not going to move as freely as it has in the, in the past. If you go bigger than that, you're going to have supply and issues, and we feel that this technology is built to be an infrastructure play where each country will need a loop facility to be able to recycle all of the material today that cannot be recycled. Uh, SK Geocentric, wholly owned subsidiary of SK, in June of 2021, took a 10% uh, ownership stake in Loop at $12 a share. Their stated goal by 2027 is to be the largest plastics recycler in the world. They've invested $260 million in advanced recycling technologies. Loop is their single largest investment. The Loop and SK joint venture just started commercializing the technology of building out. We broke ground shovels in the ground two weeks ago. Um, it's an amazing partnership for us. We're leveraging SK's uh, operations excellence, their construction, engineering, technology, knowledge. These guys run big petrochemical plants all around the world. We're leveraging all of that with them. Most importantly, we're leveraging their financial strength. All of the debt financing, all the capital needed for these facilities as far as the debt is going to be provided by SK. Loop has nothing to do with, with the debt. Uh, it's a 51-49 ownership stake. They have 51, we have 49. That 1% trade-off is for them providing the capital for the operations. On top of that, we get a licensing, a fee of 3% of uh, revenues. So that's approximately $6 million a year off $200 million estimated revenues from the facility. Um, yeah, first facility is going to be built in Alsan. Right behind that is Japan. Vietnam and China. And just to talk about Asia a little bit, and the Vietnam market alone, Nike's manufacturing process in Vietnam puts out 30,000 tons of waste a year annually that has no home. That works perfect in Loop's process. Infinite Loop Asia, others being considered Malaysia, Indonesia. There's quite a few facilities in Asia that can be built. There's a huge demand. 60% of the population is there, 70% of the global demand. Uh, pet demand is in Asia, tremendous amount of material that uh, to be recycled. And, and I'll also say this, the Asian market is the exception to that 70,000 tons that we talk about because there's so many places where you have density of population of 30, 40, 50 million people. First one will be built out at 70,000 uh, tons and then we'll ratchet up to 100 and 120,000 ton facilities. Infinite Loop France, French project, again, same design, same capacity. The site was chosen as Saint of Old France. This is a fantastic project supported by the French government. Project was put together uh, through the French brand owners, Danone, L'Oreal, L'Occitane, all these companies, strong supporters of Loop. We've been working with them for a very long time. They wanted their waste uh, to come from uh, France, so that's how this partnership was born. Targeted economics, um, not only is this good for the environment, it yeah, really helps provide a solution to the plastic waste problem, but it's economically very sound. The uh, 70,000 metric ton output, your revenues are estimated to be between 180 and $200 million. Really depending upon where you are in the world and the price of waste, waste pet plastic, all of our pricing formulas start off the waste pet plastic price. Uh, we're able to hedge against um, the ups and downs of the booms and bust cycle of uh, the fossil fuel industry, which traditional plastics have to deal with. We don't have to deal with that because we have a much flatter curve. We're using waste pet plastic as the starting point for our formulas. We signed five to 10 year supply agreements with the CPG companies, fully take or pay. I'd say there's much more demand than supply for this material out there because we're the only ones that can provide that quality, that virgin quality uh, to the customer. You'll see a lot of recycled bottles today that are gray or green or a little tint of blue. Ours are virgin quality, infinitely recycled.
long-term goals. We have a stated goal by 2030 to have 1 million tetric, uh, metric tons of capacity uh, th through, this, uh, through our different partnerships or fully owned facilities. Um, I think that's a pretty attainable goal. We're looking to be able to exceed that, especially in markets such as Asia, where there's a tremendous population and demand for the product. Um, what's great is we have global brand customers, so the customers are going to be buying from us in Quebec are the same cut ones that are dealing with uh, in Europe, in Asia. Uh, ownership, 47 million shares outstanding. Uh, there's not a big float, but a 17 million share float. My CEO owns 42%. He's never sold a share. Right behind that is SK, who owns 10%, and then Northern Private Capital, 9 So 60% between those three investors. Investment highlights, like I said, great technology, definitely uh, unique. Low temperature give us a huge advantage, big addressable market. We have the first mover advantage in the space. We're already producing material, selling it to customers, providing it to them for marketing. So we're the only ones that have proved it out at scale, building brand value through co-marketing, co-branding, uh, which just take you back there a second. I wanted to have a, a co, if you take a look at these bottles, you'll see on each and every one of these bottles, the loop logo. This is our first strategy that we put out with the brand owners. Yeah, it's been an amazing journey. I've been with the company. I was 30 years on Wall Street. The last 10 of it focused on sustainability. This is a company that I visited with back in 2018 and uh, became enamored with. And uh, I think it's a big uh, solution to a, uh, a global problem. And I really like the circularity uh, part of sustainability and that's how I ended up here. So I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, Kevin, I was wondering on the on the co-branding and take the Evian bottle as an example, have you seen consumer choice data from uh, from Evian saying that, you know, consumers are specifically choosing this, they know what's recycled plastic and it's seeing a different sales sales trajectory than others, for example? That's a great question. Um, I don't have access to that data, but they have have expressed to us that this is what where the market is going. And we did a uh, all of these trials that we have run with these companies. It's it's very important for them, especially the millennials. They're all more sustainability. And let's face it, guys, we're in the U.S. When it comes to sustainability, we're the last in the queue. Um, Europe is way ahead of us, and this is a, gr a much bigger. ESG sustainable story in Europe than it is here in the U.S. But yes, the but I don't have access to the exact data. Uh, you talked about the uh, pet pricing, the raw material, uh, and the variability there. What drives that, and do you have a sense of the long term trends of that? Uh, well, is 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 you know, long term trends of pet pricing? Or just near term. I mean, what's what's the, the moves it around? The the key. Well, I think one of the things is is oil pricing. You know, energy prices. So when when I when I started at Loop two years ago in uh, at you know, eighty dollars a barrel, all right. Virgin Pet was selling for fifteen hundred a ton. Our pet, recycled pet, was selling at nineteen hundred a ton, and we were pricing at twenty one hundred a ton. It's amazing that our pet trades at a premium to V pet because it's lower quality and it's not infinitely recyclable. You can do it once, you can do it twice, but then ultimately it's ending up in a landfill, getting incinerated. Um, when we saw the spike in in oil prices, V pet went to twenty five hundred a ton. Our pet went to twenty nine hundred a ton, and we were at thirty one hundred a ton. Now it's come back down in. So yeah, there is, we're not as much. We're gonna we're gonna trade at a premium to our pet, ten to fifteen percent. Some people think we could trade it more because it's virgin quality, it's infinitely recyclable, and as I've mentioned in 2025, I mean that's the big year. That's when these these government mandates really start to kick in, uh, and it's gonna be very interesting to see, you know, what happens um, come that time frame. Driving consumer demand up, you might even be able to trade Huge. a premium. We do. We trade at a premium now, but I mean, yeah, but even I'm a saying, bigger like premium. If consumers are demanding it; they could potentially. I think it's going to be a huge premium, but we'll see when the time comes. 
A quick question on the supply chain. Um, there, are F, there, there, there are struggles people have in separating um, recycled from non-recycled materials, particularly in the U.S. They may be better at it in Asia or Europe. I'm not sure. So, how do you ensure that you get enough? Um, do you need? To, oh, I guess the, the way to ask us is: Do you need the way garbage is collected and segregated by the uh, disposal companies to change for you to secure enough material um, to feed your plants? One hundred percent correct. And I think, as I mentioned, this is where Loop has a tremendous advantage. We don't need the high quality feedstock. We're using a low heat, low pressure process. We don't need the high quality feedstock that a lot of our peers do. If you're using high heat, high pressure, you're sorting, you need those clean bottles. You to scrub and wash them, tape the, they cut the tops off, take the labeling off, the adhesive off. That's very expensive feedstock. We can get the lowest quality feedstock from our vendors, and we're working with people on the ground. In France, Suez, the large French water company, that's what they do. They're the waste management of France. They're going to provide us with the feedstock. In Asia, SK, Viola, they're going to provide us with the feedstock. So we've hooked into partners. A lot of these facilities, you know, mechanical, recyclers, whatever, they can be built, but if you can't get the feedstock, you're in trouble. That's why we've had these partnerships in place. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. For, for, I, I think this is a 2025, 26 story, right? The plant that we built up in Terrebonne, that was where we got all the learnings to build out this technology and get the partnerships with the CPG companies and with SK and with uh, Suez. This is a 25, 20, 25, 2026, 2027 story. The revenues that are generated out of that plant today are minuscule. The revenues will start to kick in when we get that first plant built, which will be by the end of 2025. It's an 18 month ramp up, six month commissioning. So we broke ground a few weeks ago. So you're looking at two years from now. Yeah, and thank you very much, uh, Sean, for having us. Appreciate it. And uh, uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. Thank you. Monica. Thank you very much for your time. As mentioned, if you have more questions, please connect with Tim outside.
Thank you, everyone. Our next presenter is OPT, Ocean Power Technologies. And with us today, we have Philip Stratman, Chief Executive Officer of OPT, and it trades on the NYSC American Exchange under the symbol OPTT. And I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Sean. Morning, all. Intro, um, OPTT. Um, we go by OPT generally. I'm Philip Stratman. I'm the uh, CEO and President of OPT. We are headquartered just across the river um, we have a robotics facility over in Francisco, and our primary business is ocean intelligence gathering, primarily in the defense and security space, and we utilize renewable energy technology that we have, um, primarily using uh, wave power generation. Um, coupled with some wind and solar that we deploy on our asset. And then we use electric-powered electric autonomous vehicles, say autonomous surface vehicles, but it's electric boats. So think about it as drones. Drones for the ocean is probably the best way to go and look at them. They're used in a wide variety of applications, primarily for data gathering, um, be that hydrographic surveys, be that support for offshore wind companies around survey work, around mammal tracking, um, work from power, um, and also used for efforts around unexploded ordnance disposal, mine clearance measures, and other work that we've been doing. Overall, we're about 70-ish employees across the company, all based in the United States, um, hold several patents that help us safeguard um, and build the moat around the technologies to kind of help us with that kind of first mover that we have developed and uh, as, as Sean said listed on the uh, New York Stock Exchange American under OPTT. Speaking already mentioned it, three core groups of products and services that we take to market. It is the power buoy systems that we have, the system that you can see here that is the, uh, the current generation wave power system. Essentially the way it works, it sits out in the ocean as the waves move past the float collar that sits around it, think about like a like a life ring, moves up and down, that drives the generator, and then we've got up to 150 kilowatt hours of battery storage inside the system, which we constantly trickle charge, and we use that to power all sorts of payloads. Benefits of that, obviously, is we have, you know, there's no need to refill it, we have no carbon emissions, we don't have any noticeable heat signatures, we don't have any noticeable noise signatures, so you, it allows you to hide in plain sight, um, works really well for offshore wind development and industry. On the right hand side, that is, well, is one of the vehicles. That's actually the 22 footers that we've got out in Bahrain working for the US Navy Pacific Fleet. We have those vehicles in three sizes, eight foot, a 16 foot and a 22 foot. Um, the eight and the 16 are primarily electric charged powered. The 22 footer can be electric powered, but in addition, tends to be gas powered um, just and higher burst speeds. Um, again, both of those combined work then what we have our core offering, which is generally why our customers talk to us when it's helping build our recurring revenue. The maritime domain awareness and ocean intelligence space. So it is using autonomous resident persistent systems that are out in the ocean in places where you otherwise cannot collect data to collect that data do some edge computing synthesize it and then pass it back what that allows us to do is move into models where we are new we're not selling a product we are providing the service so we can provide data that we've collected to multiple customers over um, and we can work on those installations and kind of monthly recurring revenue basis, which really helps us with forecasting as we're stepping further into this solution. Already speaking, as I just mentioned, you know, our business model is really focused on data and broader monitoring areas. We kind of we look at this roughly under two broad category, you know, being data as a service, although it's primarily synthesized data, so you're looking more of as intelligence as a service, and power as a service. Power as a service is really when we're providing the systems 
and are sensor agnostic. So we're not going out there with our sensor suite to collect the data, to then sell the data. We're rather, it's rather a case of where somebody says, hey, I need this data to be collected. And we are providing the power of the robotics as a service. So we'll provide them with the buoy, we'll install it, charge them a monthly operating. Similarly speaking, for a lot of deployments that we've got on the vehicles, they may not want to own the asset, but rather we will provide them with the vehicle. We will provide operators that we've got in the company and we'll go out there, we'll install and integrate the sensors for them. We will then go out and operate the vehicle for them. We'll help them collect the data and we hand it over to them. Um, so if we move on to the next job, but again, it, it gives us the ability to monetize our lease fleet, which is another effort that we've been working on over the course of the last 12 to 18 months. And that is building out a fleet of assets that we have in inventory so that we can quickly respond to a customer, provide it to them for two months, get it back, refurb it, and then go and get it out to the next customer. So it becomes a regenerating kind of free cash flow system over and over again. Market-wise, we're broadly speaking in sort of five market categories, but the bulk of it sits in the front end that you can see here. It really sits in the defense and security space. That is almost exclusively US defense and security, with some exposure to some of our NATO allies. Um, that extent, I think the company, we're now at over 20% veterans, um, particularly on the operational side of the workforce, which really helps us deliver that service, get on base, and provide, provide the services that are being asked for by the prime contractors or by the ultimate government agency. How as a service side, again, on the security side, Think about applications such as us providing a buoy with a surveillance system that you can deploy at a water border so you can monitor who's coming across. So it's extensions of work that Homeland Security and CBP are doing, for example, so that you can go out of, out of contested areas. And long-term deployments, but with recurring revenue streams because we're maintaining and operating the systems for the customer. Offshore oil and gas um, is still an area that we're involved in, primarily on survey work. Um, as oil and gas is attempting to decarbonize some of its operations, we are providing you know, electric vehicles which allow you to go and then use a smaller survey vessel to go out there, which requires a smaller contingent. So it lowers their operating cost to do survey work on existing assets or on new drilling fields, uh, leases where they're looking at but do so in a, a manner that also reduces their carbon emissions. Um, power as a service falls into that same area. We did a project uh, a couple of years ago with Premier Oil, which is now Harbour Energy in the North Sea, where we replaced a guard vessel around a decommissioning oil field, uh, used a power buoy instead, and it materially helped lower their costs and their carbon footprint as they were waiting for a vessel of opportunity to do the abandonment of the wells. Science side, I mentioned earlier, we do some work with NOAA. Um, we also work with various research institutions to help them provide lower cost robotic assets so they can do much more with the limited budgets they have and enables us to start displacing some of the incumbent technologies. And that is a, that is a kind of a, a, a nice recurring revenue base because those are usually annual programs that roll forward with Offshore wind um, is another one where we are getting more and more involved in. Again, on the offshore wind side, it is primarily around monitoring of their lease areas pre-construction and then during construction. So we can provide zero carbon vessel traffic management systems um, using the buoys. We can do mammal tracking. We can do pre-construction surveys. Um, we are a, a member of the Offshore Wind Innovation Hub here in New York City over in Brooklyn, which is um, hosted by Equinor. So it's part of that kind of broader East Coast ecosystem of trying to use robotics and bring that into the field of offshore wind developments. And on the communication side, um, we've been public about the fact that we've been working with AT&T to work on 5G at sea prototyping and using our buoys to start deploying comms nodes out in the ocean so you can get those heavy data loads that are being generated systems and get them more effectively back into the cloud, um, particularly when it comes to defense and comms channels. So, Why now? OPT has been around for quite a while. Um, 
I was appointed CEO two and a half years ago. And in that time frame, we have materially turned over the company. We've changed over the entire management team. Um, we've most recently announced the fact that we have cycled down almost most of our R&D activities because we've now got fully proven out commercialized systems, uh, commercialized systems that are available for our customers to use for the service. We've reconfigured the team to go after the defense and security space. You know, we recently announced the, the award of three IDIQs from NOAA, that's essentially government master service agreements, which have a combined ceiling of $21.5 million, I believe. Um, and we are working on, on several. That, that's really helped us position the company from where it used to be to where it is going now, which is, you know, moving into utilizing the underlying assets that we have to collect the data and intelligence that the customers are asking for and provide that to them at a much lower cost point than they would be able, than they would need to pay if they went the traditional route. Here, the, the revenue growth uh, has been achieved under the new management team. It's been a steady track. Um, actually, we've got our earnings call next week, Thursday, for our second quarter um, fiscal year results. So our, our fiscal year runs May 1 to end April. So that, that will be See here is that since revamping, across and over we've started to grow the revenue to a more stable base and that gives us the ability to sort of work on our forecasting build up the company reorient it to where it needs to be and execute on the strategy that we've put in place backlog shows that we will be opportunities that we require to go and get the revenues to grow to the point where we can be cash flow positive um, over. We do have a forecast on positive cash flow. We put out a press release, it's either two or three weeks ago, um, on some further optimizations we did within the company. You know, we optimized the headcount to reduce our quarterly burn, so that will start getting reflected in you know, the current quarter and going forward. What that has enabled us to do is really retool the organization in addition to the management changes we did and the focus to have more than 50% of our headcount focused on operations and delivery. I explained that is where the driver of our revenues sit because that is the recurring revenue base when it comes to solutions that we're putting out for our, our customer base. Our, our pipeline, and this is a snapshot of the pipeline as it was, I believe, on our fiscal year. And you can see here, it includes a healthy mix of just buoys, just vehicles, and then vehicles and, and buoys combined. And on the vehicle and buoys combined, what is important to note is we recently demonstrated the ability to totally dock and charge one of our vehicles. So what you're seeing, you know, with superchargers that you see across the highway network in the United States, next generation of these systems, what you'll be able to do is deploy forward based charging stations and data exfil stations. So you can have the vehicles out there collecting data that come alongside the buoy, that charge themselves up whilst they're charging, they're uploading the data to the buoy, which has got a bigger processing power, and they're using the comms hub that you have on there to put it into the cloud. That materially does, it really starts moving the operator out of the field and puts it sort of, you know, wherever you have a cozy cabin that they can sit in rather than having to go and sit them on a boat. Pipeline, as it stands for the fiscal year in terms of overall opportunities, sits at about eight ish million dollars. Obviously, fluctuates on, a, on an ongoing basis. But what gives us great comfort is the fact that a lot of that is customers that are under NDA or customers that are actually reviewing our proposals or customers even more so that are in active negotiations on various efforts that we got underway. Quite often see a lot of our press releases going out and it's unnamed US agencies or unnamed prime contractors that has partially to do with the fact that a ton of this sits in the defense and security space.
It value proposition for our customers and for our shareholders, we think is, is, is very clear. You know, we decrease and or eliminate certain costs for our customers. Well, that means they can go and more effectively allocate more in off OPEX expenditures, which are much easier to make than having to purchase assets, particularly in the rapidly evolving technology world. They don't want to own the assets because by the time they have trained their operators on how to use them, you're onto the next generation of systems. Um, us providing the assets for operations for them allows them to you know, shift expenditure from CapEx to OPEX and use of OPEX in a much more expeditious way. Tyranny improves their safety. You know, every time you remove somebody from operating out in the ocean, that is a, that is a, that is a time. Um, so personally, from my background, I spent some time in the Navy and then working in oil and gas. So every time you can go and remove an operator out of that loop, it is a good thing because that reduces insurance costs and everything in between. Much more rapid decision making speed for our customers. You know, what has happened on the onshore world in oil and gas and energy and the defense and security with automation and drones and everything in between is only just starting to come in the ocean. So this really starts getting them into real time decision making, which they haven't been able to do. And it materially enhances their sustainability efforts. Every time we put out a vehicle or a buoy, that is a boat that's not going out, that's not burning bunker fuel. Get to claim the carbon credits from it, they get to go and claim the lower emissions from it, um, and it decreases their cost. Win win for them. And what that enables us to do is to go and build that recurring revenue base that our shareholders get excited about because that helps start introducing some certainty around where things are heading, how you scale it up, what are repeat customers, and it gets us into that customer intimacy so we can start. Yeah, on the leadership side, so you got myself um, as CEO, you got um, Bob Powers who's here in the audience, he's my CFO, and you got Matt Badini who's my chief. Um, a, between us, lots of experience in private equity, public markets, and in particularly in the maritime defense and oil and gas space. Um, Matt was with us marketing for 15 appointed him as chief commercial officer as part of the realignment that we did to focus the management team and to focus the company on really driving forward what needs to be done for customers and building that pipeline up that gets us that certain now, investment highlights again here these are the bookings forecast that i mentioned um this is you know you, you can see since we took over uh, as management you know, we did a close to 4x on bookings in our last fiscal year. You know, we, we, uh, we put out for this year, which I think gets us to just over extrapolating from that. Obviously, bookings then translates into backlog, which then translates into revenue generation that we can go and deliver on. Um, you know, we have a clear strategy, we have a first mover advantage particularly as it comes to data and power as a service out in the ocean. Um, we do have, we've put out our path to profitability and free cash flow over the next six quarters on our side. That gets us to you know, 17, 18 months from today. Um, and we have a, a, an experienced management team. Um, well, Matt and I, um, members of our board, and then the, the team that we've put together on the operational side and on the engineering side. Overall, that clear focus on defense and security, you know, given, given global developments, um, it, it is certainly, and we are seeing a material increase in interest for more rapidly deploying autonomous assets into the Navy. Um, we've seen that through public about this, the work we've done with Fifth Fleet in Bahrain as part of Task Force 59. And that is kind of the U.S. Navy's uh, autonomous and artificial intelligence task force to try and integrate and operationalize autonomous vehicles, autonomous systems, and it, ocean intelligence gathering into operational force projection. So that's something that we're we're pretty excited about participating in. The strategy we set out is working. You know, since the end of our last quarter, uh, we announced the three NOAA. Use that I mentioned, we demonstrated the charging 
of vehicles remotely using our buoys. So you need global power to then charge up an electric ocean drone to then do more operations, so to further the footprint, uh, carbon footprints, and extend you know data gathering operations and intelligence operations that, that that you're conducting out there. Just to conclude, you know, I said, you know, balance management team, the season management team, we have a very strong balance sheet. Um, we have cash in hand to execute on the path to profitability that we laid out. And we've expanded the business model and strategy and really are focusing on and security, recurring revenues, and providing data gathering and, and ocean power as a service. With that, let me turn it over to questions. Any questions from the audience? All right. Thanks, Philip. The company's undergone quite a transformation, let's say, over the last few years. Might make sense to talk a little bit about what has happened, because the company and the technology has been around for a while in terms of the buoys themselves, right? And there may be investors that are familiar with the company, but it's become a very different company in the last couple of years. And, and I think discussing that transition and then what's led to obviously to backlog right and pipelines and and being able to see real revenue starting to come in uh maybe address that and then talk about the commercialization inflection point i think that's really what it comes down to is uh you know it's what's happening that's creating the revenue yeah absolutely thank you thank you Sean. Uh, what the company did in the past was research and development of wave power systems Originally for grid connected work, I think that's going back a decade plus ago. Then it changed its focus from going, okay, we're not going to do grid connected wave power, we're going to do non grid connected wave power. That helped prove out the technology that is being used on the current generation of the wave power systems. And then what we did when we came in, you know, changed the management team over. Most of us came from, you know, I said either defense or oil and gas space. So we had used we were very used to to a certain way of operating with suppliers such as OPT. So what we ended up doing is we pivoted the company to like, okay, we're not going to sell our products and service uh, solutions you know, directly to the customer because then you need to train them up. Then they need to go and operate it. And you don't really know how they're using it. You know, by shifting from CapEx to OpEx on their expenditure, that's helped us get that backlog built up because it materially reduces the barrier to entry for them to participate when it comes to new technologies. The other thing we did is we build out our own small technology integration and software development team so that we can actually have one standardized surveillance solution that we can deploy on our systems, including on the vehicles, because what that enables us to do is like now we were able to remove the conversation to even focus on buoys and vehicles. Survey work, or you want to do surveillance work, here's how we do this for you. And yes, we're going to use autonomous vehicles or we're going to use buoys to do that work. But you don't need to worry how they work because we have demonstrated over you know several years of runtime that they operate well. And again, all of that helps us move from, you know, help us move from R and D to proving out the technology to what is now what I would consider to be operationalizing it. You know, I think we're I think we're at that cusp between commercialization and operationalizing it. I think we're that that is shifting the focus and that last effort that we publicly announced by shifting the headcount that we had and really you know making the majority of the company focused on operations i think that that is sort of that you know that last bit that gets us edging along philip we have a question from our online audience uh, what is the outlook for GM, and what is the expected GM at scale? As you've seen from the the last quarter release that we had, um, our gross profit margin tends to sit at the fifty-ish percent mark. We see that at around that level, marginally improving, mainly as we're shifting towards that increased service model is the more we can go and push out robotics as a service and data as a service, it enables us to put the operators, that are salaried headcount, and put them out over and over again. So same as the vehicles and assets, once the fleet is built up, all of those pay for, the, pay for them multiple times over. So 
And if you're looking at our quarterlies, that's a good indication, plus some marginal improvements on where things are. All right. Thank you very much. Um, as mentioned before, if you have any other questions, feel free to find Tim and uh, he could schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting for you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, the next presentation is going to be from Nick um, Blitterswaik, uh, CEO from UGE International, which trades on the OTCQB under the symbol UGEIF and is also traded on the TSWX. Uh, so if I assume I just go uh, one over in my presentation to there. All right. Thank you, Charlie. And, and thanks, everyone, for, for being here, both uh, in person and online. Um, so, so, yeah, so UGE, like, like Charlie just mentioned, we're trading on the TSXV and also on the OTCQB. Um, we, um, if I just, just go through, like, at a high level what we do, we are a developer of solar and energy storage projects, more on the solar side than energy storage, although energy storage has really been growing quickly here in the last couple of years. Um, really believe we're in the, the sweet spot for this overall industry in terms of our project size and, and our our approach to developing these types of projects. I think uh, a lot of you would know that solar and renewable energy as a whole is growing incredibly quickly. Um, in the last couple of years, it's been more than 50% of all new energy capacity being built out in the US, for example. Um, within that, though, the, 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 the biggest impediment to growth is the um, uh, interconnection timelines of projects being more focused on these mid-scale projects like we are. Uh, those projects move more quickly and, uh, and, and think that gives us a better ability to um, scale and do more over time here. Um, we also have a full life, life cycle approach to what we do uh, in that we, uh, we originate our projects, develop, engineer, build them out, project finance them, and then own and operate them. And that also gives us higher returns, higher cash flow profile, um, and a bigger overall impact uh, as, as well. Um, we're dual headquartered New York and Toronto. So myself and Sabrina are both based here in the New York area. Um, and um, and we do projects across the U.S. So it's really a, a U.S. development focused company. Um, we're a, a team of about 65 or so with a few extra uh, on there for consultants. We've completed over 750 projects over our lifetime, um, which totals over 500 megawatts of experience. So we're in the right place, right time, really feel uh, like we have a good platform and a good team in place to take advantage of the tailwinds that are in our industry right now. Um, in particular, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is now a year and a year and a quarter uh, in. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act has a lot of targeted incentives directly to the types of projects that we do. So projects that are mid-scale on things like landfills and what have you, projects that benefit low and moderate income communities, et cetera, et cetera. So the Inflation Reduction Act, kind of the, the one of the main pillars of it is the investment tax credit, which as a baseline provides a 30% tax credit to our types of projects. But there's a lot of adders in addition to that uh, that can bring that number hypothetically all the way up to 70 percent, seven zero, um, which is really, really significant for um, providing a, a really good economic return on these types of projects. Um, like mentioned, we, we do trade on the, the TSXV. Um, we are, um, you know, as we go through this, I think keep some of these numbers in mind in terms of market cap versus the value of the projects that we're developing. Um, we came off a bit after our Q3s, or leading into and after our Q3s here in the last couple of weeks. Um, as of right now, I think our U.S. market cap is just a little bit over 20 million USD. Um, we currently have uh, like contracts to develop projects in the 3 billion USD type of fair market value range. Um, we, we report different stages within that backlog or within that pipeline, sorry. The more advanced stuff that we call our backlog, that in itself is about a billion dollars USD worth, worth of uh, fair market value of our project. So I feel there's an incredible, incredible amount of upside as we execute on our on our business plan here. Um, it's also very tightly held. We Insiders own about 33% of the shares. Um, we've been frequent buyers over the, the, the months and years uh, that we've been a public company here. Um, so I, I talked about being a full life cycle developer. Um, that's a bit unique within our industry. There's a lot of like developers that develop and then and then flip out of projects. There's uh, builders of projects. There's um, you know funds and, and and so on that like to buy and own projects in our space. Uh, in the mid scale space that we're in, it's our hypothesis that being a full life cycle developer allows us to have a bigger impact for many different reasons. But um, it's a lot more efficient for the the clients and the landowners and the rooftop owners uh, that we work with. Um, so it's more efficient, less margin stacking, and so on. And we're able to to to, to do projects more quickly and, and capture more of that value as well. Um, you know, I mentioned we have a a really strong team. I'm not going to go through all the detail uh, in the interest of time here, but this presentation is on our website, and I think uh, if, uh, if you take the time to read through the profiles, you'll, you'll come away very impressed as well. Um, the team's really in place 
to more or less develop uh, and, and execute on about 100 megawatts of projects per year. Um, and, uh, and we'll go through what that means for numbers here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, the, the structure is in place and we're just heads down on executing on that. Um, this full life cycle approach to what we do um, really feel like it allows us to play the best of both worlds. Uh, so on the one hand, on the, the, the green side here, as a developer that's originating these projects ourselves, as we bring them forth, as we finance them, we take out what we call a developer surplus. So from a cash flow perspective, it's kind of like we're developing and selling the projects in that we, we have that cash back to the company. And I will go through that more here shortly as well, because it's an important part of the story. Um, but then also building up this long-term portfolio of uh, recurring revenue over you know, 20, 30, 40 years, depending on the project, allows us to build this really safe long-term profile for the company. Our recurring revenue, we're averaging about 90, 90 um, percent gross margins on that recurring revenue. Um, and so as this scales, really excited for what this means for the, the long-term uh, economic returns for the company. Um, so the, the backlog that I mentioned, that's about one third of our, our, our total um, like kind of site control you know, contracts we have to develop projects, but the backlog is the, the more advanced stages within that. Um, just to go through like how this works, we, we, uh, when we're developing these projects, which takes, as it says here, two to three years, the investment is pretty minimal in terms of three to 10 cents per watt on average. Um, but as those projects finish their development cycle, there's a milestone called NTP or notice to proceed. We get those projects financed, we build them out, and then we start owning and operating them. Um, the developer surplus, uh, we're, we're, we're targeting an average of 40 cents per watt. Um, and then the recurring revenue is looking like about 21, 22 cents per watt per year over that 25 to 40 year life cycle. So if you apply that to our current backlog, um, you would look at a developer surplus of about 137 million USD um, and then recurring revenue of 72 million USD. Of course, we're always adding new projects, uh, you know, our origination teams out there finding new projects every, every week, um, but, um, but that as a baseline. Just remind us, I mean, that developer surplus right there alone is six or seven times our current market cap, never mind the recurring revenue, which is uh, three and a half times the market cap. So as you can tell, I think we're incredibly undervalued uh, right now. Um, as, the, as the backlog is built out, you see how that revenue profile stacks up. The, the green is our um, recurring revenue, and then the, uh, the grayish blue is the gross margin on that. Um, so you see how, you know, as long as we just you know, keep our heads down here, um, even the 100 megawatt mark, which is a kind of a short to medium term goal of ours, um, even that, the recurring revenue and, uh, and, and gross margins would be uh, higher than our current market cap just on the first 100 megawatts. Um, over the last several years, so, you know, one aspect to the story is that the, the IPP side of the business where we've been um, financing and holding on to our assets is really something we just pivoted to over the last few years and now seeing that portfolio mature and these projects drop out from the other end. Um, since, we, since we announced that pivot in 2020, each year we put out goals for what our growth will be um, in terms of the backlog growth each year and each year we've exceeded that growth. So you see that stairway up and to the right. Um, there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunity in the space. I think like if you follow the, the overall space in the public markets, you, you, you might be even surprised to hear that uh, based on how solar stocks have done this year. But in the, in the industry, there's as much opportunity, if not more, as there ever has been. Um, and so we're really excited about just continuing to, to see this growth play out over time. Um, I was in New York when I started the company. I'm Canadian, uh, which is partly how it leads to us being uh, first, uh, first listed in Canada. Um, I was in the New York area when I started it. So kind of broadly, the Northeast has been a traditional hotbed for us. Uh, community solar has been growing really quickly. That's actually, as we'll see, a really significant portion of our, of our, um, of our backlog right now, uh, about, about 80% or so. Community solar has been growing across the country. And as it, as it has been, uh, we've been growing across the country as well. I think you'll see additional states, especially in like the Midwest and Southwest, uh, be, be, be colored in here uh, in, the, in the quarters and years to come. Um, so, you know, we have this really big pipeline. I've thrown out numbers already on, on how big that is. Uh, the numbers, I think when Sabrina and I are telling the story, it kind of feels silly sometimes, to be honest, versus, versus the market cap. So, um, but uh, what we're really focused on right now is we have this massive pipeline. It will continue to grow, but we're really focused on bringing those projects through to operating status, seeing that operating portfolio scale up, see the cash flow profile of the company really change as that happens. Um, so, so 2023 has actually been like a really fantastic year for this happening. Um, our uh, assets that have hit NTP, um, 
you know, it's funny. It's okay. I have to look back here, but uh, about 16 times, um, I think what, uh, what they were, um, at the beginning of the year. Uh, so we've seen that scale up really significantly and we're consistently every quarter now having projects hit NTP. Um, and, and then once they hit NTP, it's just a matter of building it out. Um, in, in case that's not clear, that's kind of seen as, uh, kind of like the, the, the bread and butter or easy part, commodity part of getting these projects into the operating portfolio. So it's mostly just a matter of time. Uh, the operating portfolio, um, by the end of this month, we're expecting it to be very close to three times what it was at the beginning of this year. So including a few projects that uh, either are or, or, or will be completed uh, within Q4 here. So it's been a really good year for us scaling up um, and looking forward to 2024 uh, continuing down that path. Um, in, in terms of a few examples, just to put a little bit of meat on the bone here in terms of the types of stuff that we do. Um, so here's three examples. This one is in Westchester County, New York, so just north of the city within the Con Edison service territory. That's important because Con Edison, people that live here, you pay a lot for electricity. This project goes on the rooftop of these buildings. Anybody can um, subscribe to a, a community solar project. You get at least a 10% discount off your bill. So you're buying credits for clean energy, a discount to your bill. It's, it's really a win-win. The building itself gets a lease payment for your rooftop. As you'll see, we also do ground mount projects as well. So it's kind of a win-win-win for everybody involved. Clean energy, cheaper energy, lease payments for your roof or land. Um, and that's you know why we and, and the industry are growing so quickly is because uh, ec the economics make so much sense. As I was on the, 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 the subway this morning, I was reading, uh, Ian Y came out with a report just yesterday saying that solar is 28% cheaper than, um, than, the, uh, than any fossil fuel, than the, the cheapest fossil fuel uh, source, which I guess would be natural gas right now. It's why you know solar is really the, the, the energy source of now and the future, certainly in my opinion. Um, this project here is in Maine, so Norway, Maine, not, uh, not, uh, not over in Europe. Um, this project was a capped landfill in this town in Maine. Um, we put a solar system on the landfill. Uh, people within the town buy energy from the system. Same construct, clean energy, cheaper energy, no risk. Um, and then also because on a landfill, we get an additional ITC adder. So we get a 40% tax credit from the government for, for developing this project. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act set that uh, construct for the ITC in place for a minimum of 10 years, automatically extending if carbon emissions haven't dropped by, I think it's 70% um, by the end of the 10 years, uh, unless there's, you know, like, unless there's a miracle, that's not going to happen. So this, this ITC framework is in place for a very long time. If you're thinking to yourself, what if Trump wins? Trump extended the ITC uh, when he was in office, as did, uh, you know, it was actually put in place by George Bush or originally. So I think like the ITC aspect of this should be pretty strong. Last example here, this is a field house. Uh, this one actually is also in Maine. So this is another rooftop, but another community solar project. And, um, you know, if you go through our, our, our website, there's a lot of case studies of the types of projects that we do. Um, across the, the overall backlog, um, so the biggest portion of the, the solar projects are community solar. Um, so a uh, way to think about community solar, I actually I'll go through it in more detail in a second. One project serves many off-takers. Um, battery storage is increasing really quickly right now. Um, we have a, a growing slice of the pie there as well. Um, one of my favorite stats right now, there was more battery storage installed in 2022 in the US than new fossil fuel capacity. So like the inflection point for battery storage has happened and, and we're playing a, a role there. And then lastly, um, PPAs. So this would be a one-to-one -one arrangement. Uh, we have some projects that are uh, directly servicing a city or a town or a building, um, but it's, uh, as you can see, a much smaller slice of the pie. Um, because community solar is so much of the, of the pie, I just want to go into a little bit more detail here. Um, one number to keep in mind is that somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of households can't uh, install solar themselves because they live in an apartment or a condo or they rent or, or, or whatever the case may be. Community solar allows us to install a centralized project, divvy up that energy to households that subscribe to the energy they buy. Uh, as I've said, that energy at a discount. Um, they use energy like they always have. Uh, but they but they get clean energy at a discount. Um, it's also really well tailored to like low and moderate income communities, disadvantaged communities, people who can't afford solar. When you think about that housing profile that I mentioned, um, which is why it has good regulatory and government support and why we've seen this grow so much across the country in recent years. Um, so from an impact perspective, it makes, uh, it, 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 it does really well, but also um, because of the Inflation Reduction Act, because we're selling this energy at retail rates as opposed to wholesale rates, the economics of 
uh, community solar or, or is really, really strong as well. Um, we, uh, we are an impact-driven company. We put out an annual ESG report. Next one will be with our, our year-end financials in March. Um, the full report's on the website uh, for anyone who's interested or, of course, contact Sabrina or myself. Um, we have three analysts that cover the, cover the stock right now, two in Canada, one in the U.S. Um, average uh, target is uh, two and a half to three times where we're trading right now. Um, anybody who'd like to uh, be in, put in touch with the analysts or see the reports, you can also just let me know. Um, and then uh, I think lastly is we, um, because we have this large portfolio, uh, we pledge these projects as security for what we call a green bond. Um, we've been in the market for these about every three or four months. We just passed our five-year anniversary from the first time that we, uh, that we did that uh, or issued our first one. Um, in the kind of current market environment, we've been issuing these bonds, again, secured bonds, 150% 100, coverage ratio uh, with a 9% coupon. So um, it's something that we've seen interest from uh, individuals and high net worths up to university endowments, foundations, uh, energy funds, and what have you. So we've had good success with that over time. Um, I, you know, going back to the public market side of things, it's also allowed us to fund the, the, the development of these projects. Um, we haven't raised equity in about three years and, 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 and have no plans to. Um, so with that, uh, you're happy to take any Q&A. Um, you know, I should have mentioned off the top, I'm the founder and CEO of the company. Uh, Sabrina works with us. Uh, you know, we put capital work across the you know entire uh, chain from the corporate side to the project side, um, and and so Sabrina uh, works uh, works on a lot of that. Uh, and then Stephanie, our CFO, is based up in Toronto. So again, thank you. And any any questions? Happy to take them. Nick, thank you. Does anyone have any questions from the audience? Not any questions from the virtual. So Nick, we have a question here from the online audience. Uh, how much capital do you need to raise over the next 12 months to execute your development plan and cover the burn rate? Yeah, so we, um, I think it's really important to work backwards from the project side. So like on the project side, we work with banks and um, in essence, institutional funds who buy these tax credits. So in the next year, uh, I'm just sort of spitballing, but that number is in the, North of fifty million dollar USD range into the projects, um, and um, and and you know they, that's that's the least of our concerns. Frankly, you know we have really good relationships there. Um, we've closed multiple uh, transactions in that space in twenty twenty three, and are, are I think well placed for twenty twenty four as well. Um, and then working backward from there, you know the green bonds we issued. I think it was three green bonds in twenty twenty three. Probably aim to do a similar uh, number next year, uh, which will fund the, the 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 development of these projects, which includes. Um, the overhead that we put into into that. So, you know, I'm just just doing some quick mental math in my mind. I think this year we raised north of 10 million USD in green bonds. Um, I think with the growing portfolio, probably for 2024, we'll look for you know probably north of 15 million dollars uh, on that side of things. Along those uh, lines, uh, somebody's asking what your cash position is. So we just announced our Q3s last week, and the cash position was 3.5 million USD, and we. Um, We've closed a green bond since then as well. So that's in the neighborhood of where that would be. Um, I should say, you know, the developer surplus aspect of the company, I think, is missed by a lot of people. So just to kind of reiterate that again, as we're building out these projects, even before they start operating, we, in essence, like pay ourselves back out of the proceeds of funding these projects, including the tax credit, um, this, this developer surplus. So um, the income statement really doesn't paint the right picture of the cash flow profile for the company. It's important to look at the cash flow profile for that reason. And we have uh, an attendee who is, would like to develop a community solar project in British Columbia and asking what your bandwidth is for Canadian projects. So I'll say that community solar right now is active in, uh, I think last I counted 22 states. I know that there's a, a few states that are like in the process of passing legislation now. So that number uh, could have grown, certainly will grow here shortly. It's not something that you can do just anywhere. Um, in Canada, Nova Scotia is the one province that had a pilot program for it. Um, so strictly for community solar, uh, it's not so easy to say, okay, British Columbia, here we come. Um, I'm from British Columbia, so I'd love nothing more than to do projects there. Um, I, I, I would welcome, I know, I know our contact information is up on the page here. I'd welcome that individual to contact me and, and I can, I can uh, put, put uh, him or her in, the right, uh, you know, in contact with the right people. Uh, another uh, investor is asking about your your backlog, and um, 
if it, it your backlog is greater than your current market cap, are you considering uh, buybacks, stock buybacks? Yeah, yeah. This, this has actually been a topic of conversation here recently, and and the uh, the, the short answer is yes. Um, I, I think that like we're I've mentioned multiple times how tremendously undervalued we believe we are. Um, I think that over over the short, medium, and long term, I think there's a lot of reason for us to consider. I mean. On an earlier slide, we looked at a developer surplus across our backlog, which was six or seven times our market cap. I think that tells you um, that a good place for us to invest would be in our own equity. So it's certainly a consideration. We want to make sure that uh, you know we're doing that at the right time and uh, and, and and you know what, what what have you. So I don't want to promise uh, any sort of time frame on that, but yeah, it's a major consideration. And this one pains me just a little bit, but they're asking when do you planning to uplist the Nasdaq? Um, the uh, um, yeah, and being here at, a, at an OCC uh, event, uh, it's a good question. Um, it's been part of our medium-term plan for sure. Uh, I think um, you know we we've been scaling as a company quite significantly. We have a certain size range in mind that we'd like to get to um, before we execute on that plan. Um, you know, I think we can. I think we've seen our, ourselves growing really quickly here. So I don't know if that's one year or three year or exactly when that is, but uh, but it's certainly something we plan to do as we scale. All right. If there aren't any other questions, Nick, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you as well.
<laughs> All right, welcome again, everyone. Our next presentation is from Bernard Chan, Chief uh, Executive Officer at RE Royalties, which it trades on the OTCQX market under the symbol RROYF, as well as the TS TSXV under the symbol RE. So, welcome. Thanks everyone uh, for attending the conference today uh, in person and also uh, online. Uh, my name is Bernard Tan and I'm the CEO uh, and co-founder of RE Royalties, uh, the first royalty company focused entirely on the renewable and sustainable energy sector. Uh, our symbol uh, is RE on the Venture Exchange and RROYF on the OTCQX. Uh, before I begin, I would like to point out that this presentation will contain some forward-looking statements, so please refer to our regulatory filings for more information. Uh, our financial statements are also prepared in Canadian dollars, so the currency in my, presenta my, in my presentation today will be in... Uh, uh, my presentation will also cover a couple of things, an overview uh, and background of who we are, a snapshot of our portfolio, and also our recent uh, financial results. Uh, the market opportunity and how the royalty business uh, can really take advantage of some of these opportunities and also and then wrap up with our plans for the next 12 months. Uh, our vision and objective at RE Royalties is quite uh, simple and straightforward. One, uh, to generate strong economic re and long-term returns for all our investors and two, to really help build a cleaner and more sustainable future. How we set to accomplish this objective is by acquiring a portfolio of growing, long-term, stable, and diversified royalty streams from operating and late-stage renewable projects that will provide our investors with resilient, sustainable, and growing long-term cash flows. We aim to provide the trifecta of investment, a strong yield, high growth, and clean sustainability. A uh, little bit of background of who we are. Uh, we started in 2016. Um, in that year, we recognized uh, really the opportunity to apply a well-proven royalty business model to renewables, where royalty financing just did not exist. We saw similar parallels to the exponential growth of royalty financing in the resource sector in the mid, um, similar to what we saw in the resource sector in the mid 2000s which really established the billion dollar royalty giants of today, like Franco Nevada or Wheaton Precious Metals. In November, and 20, in November of 2018, we took the company public through a uh, RTO listing on the Venture Exchange. And as of last year, our shares also trade on the OTCQX. Our goal is to be the premier royalty company in the renewable and clean tech sector. To date, we have raised over $68 million and invested that into a portfolio of royalties on solar, wind, renewable natural gas, battery and energy efficiency projects in Canada, the United States, Chile and Mexico. We are also a growth oriented company. In 2021, we were named as one of Canada's top growing companies by the Globe and Mail. Uh, we've realized year-over-year -year growth of 128% uh, in the first three quarters of this year compared to last year. We have invested over $37 million in the last two years alone, uh, which will further fuel our future growth uh, going forward. Earlier this year, we also raised $18 million in green bonds, um, and currently we have roughly about $10 million in unallocated cash, uh, and over 40 million in signed term sheets in our backlog. This will help us continue that growth trajectory uh, into 2024 and, and onwards. Our investments also meet several of the UN Sustainable Development Goals as the impact of our investments generate a significant amount of clean energy per year and reduces a large amount of greenhouse gases. For those investors looking for a pure play impact investment, with a current 7% uh, dividend yield uh, and a strong growth profile, we check many of those boxes. 
This is sort of a quick snapshot of everything of our portfolio. Uh, to date, we have made over 70 million in investments across 21 different uh, completed transactions. We currently own a portfolio of 113 royalties in solar, wind, hydro, biogas, and energy efficiency projects. By dollar value, approximately 39% of our investments are currently in solar. 25% in batteries, 13% in wind, 11% in energy efficiency, 9% biogas, and 3% in hydro. Uh, these royalties have a remaining life ranging anywhere between 10 years all the way up to 30 years, and will bring in about $26 million in new cash flow with no related costs. To date, our investment portfolio has generated an IRR of 19% on an unlevered basis. In terms of geographic concentration, our investments are primarily in Canada and the US, with a smaller percentage in Chile and Mexico. Um, in Canada, our investments uh, span several provinces like British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, and Nova Scotia. Uh, as previously mentioned, our investments also meet several of the UN Sustainable Development Goals relating to clean energy, uh, resilient infrastructure, sustainable communities, and climate action. The projects in our portfolio currently generate approximately 400 megawatts of, uh, of um, clean energy capacity per year, uh, which is enough to power 133,000 homes and abate over 421,000 uh, tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is a very detailed um, uh, lists of all the transactions that we've done over the, uh, the last five or six years. I won't go into the details of each, but wanted to point a couple sort of highlights. Um, most of the royalties we generate come from projects that are already in operations uh, or currently in construction, which means immediate or near-term cash flows uh, to the company. The other aspect I'd like to also highlight is also who operates these projects and who pays the royalties, which include uh, some very strong investment grade utilities like BC Hydro, Hydro One, Nova Scotia Power, or Green Mountain Power, which really highlights the resiliency and credit strength of those cash flows. A quick snapshot on our capitalization and, and financials. Uh, we currently have about 43 million shares outstanding with a market cap of roughly about 27 million. Uh, insiders own about 25% of the company, so very strongly aligned with shareholders. The remaining 75% are held by institutions, a couple institutions, but primarily family offices and accredited investors. Um, in, at, in 2022, uh, we raised 18 million in green bonds and equity, about a 10 million bond versus 8 million equity split, and we've deployed, fully deployed that capital. Uh, in 2023, we issued another 18 uh, million in green bonds uh, earlier this year, in the first half of this year, with a term of five years and 9% per annum uh, in terms of the interest. Um, we're currently sitting on approximately 10 million in cash that's uh, not yet allocated, so we do have some dry powder to be able to invest in the coming uh, week. And we expect uh, to fully deploy those funds really uh, you know, I would say in the next one to two-ish months. Uh, for the first three quarters of this, this year, we realized uh, approximately 7.2 million in revenue and income. And once our cash is deployed, we expect an annualized uh, revenue run rate in the nine to 10 million range with an EBITDA of roughly about seven to seven and a half million. Uh, as you can see, uh, on the bar chart on the right, uh, despite all the issues in the market relating to whether it's the pandemic, geopolitical events, inflation, uh, we have been able to deliver very consistent and resilient growth in our revenues and income, uh, and also cash flow over the past eight quarters. Um, as you can also, uh, we also, one of the things uh, as a venture and OTC company as well is we also pay a dividend roughly uh, of four cents uh, per share per year, which at the current share price is about a 7% uh, yield. And that uh, dividend is, is paid on a quarterly basis. 
Um, in terms of the market opportunity, uh, really, how large is this market opportunity? Um, as many of you know, climate change, energy security, resiliency has been and will continue to be a major econ uh, economic driver today and also into the near and long-term future. Despite all these challenges that we see in the markets today, um, in 2022, we saw over a trillion dollars invested globally in the energy transition, a 31% year-over-year increase compared to the prior year. This trend is expected to continue on an upward trajectory over the next few decades. And according to research uh, by Bloomberg, investments will have to increase to over 4.4 trillion, that's with a T, per year if the, true, if the world truly wants to reach its net zero goals. In short, this is a very large market and will continue to grow significantly. RE royalties only need to capture a very small sliver of this long-term macroeconomic trend to achieve our goals. Renewables, by and large, are not, is not a resource play, but rather it's a technology play. A lot of the growth in renewables that we see today are driven by underlying te technology improvements. Similar to our smartphones and computers in the last few decades, the cost of producing and storing energy from renewables continue to drop year over year. Uh, again, according to Bloomberg's research, um, that today, over two thirds of the world's population live in countries where solar or wind are the cheapest source of new electricity. Many places, renewables can displace traditional coal and gas without any subsidies. So investing in renewables is fundamentally an investment in technology and human innovation. In terms of why we like the royalty model, um, I'm not going to go through each individual point, but this slide really highlights some of the advantage uh, of why we like this business model. This is very similar to what you see in the oil and gas or mining industries with some great companies like Franco Nevada, Wheaton Precious Metal, or Freehold Royalties. Uh, the key takeaways that I like to point out is that uh, a lot of times royalties are based on gross revenues. So this helps shelters our cash flow from unpredictable factors like rising taxes or an increasing cost environment. Another beauty of, 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 of uh, a royalty company is that our costs are relatively fixed. So by growing our top line, we don't actually have to grow our costs. Uh, you know, we have a fairly small team, roughly about 10 people, and we can grow in, um, you know, by, from where we are without uh, having to add a lot more overheads. We also don't need significant construction or sustaining capital to get uh, an asset operational. Uh, in order to generate those cash flows. So we can actually uh, size our investments to the capital that we have. We can also achieve uh, cash flow diversification much quicker. We spread our investments over multiple projects in multiple jurisdictions in multiple technologies. And as most of you know, the royalty business model is well utilized and well proven in many industries except renewables. Being a first mover allows us to access some of the best opportunities for royalty financing. So what do we invest in? We only invest in renewable and sustainable energy projects. Uh, we don't do any fossil fuels. Uh, projects that can help mitigate climate change and offset uh, greenhouse gases. We like proven technology, and we do have a bias for operating projects or or those that will reach operational uh, status in the very near term, because we like cash flow. Um, in terms of where we invest, we like geographical uh, diversification. Part of that is politics can be quite unpredictable. Um, and also, it's also because electricity does not trade like a global commodity, even though every electron is the same. Markets can be very regional, and we want to diversify our risks across multiple uh, our targeted returns are generally in the 10 to 20% range, which allows us to support a strong yield to our shareholders and also drive growth. Our goal is to ensure a diversified portfolio of royalties from across jurisdictions and technologies. 
In terms of how we invest, there are two main ways that we do so. Uh, one, for about 20% of our investments, we acquire long-term gross revenue royalties, typically 15 to 20 years. And the second way, which is about 80% of our portfolio, is we, util we utilize a short-term loan and acquire a long-term royalty. This is really our favorite product because um, it allows us to recycle that same dollar of capital. Uh, to illustrate using the step chart that you see uh, on the right, um, you can see that based on a three-year loan term, we can lend that same amount of capital seven times across 20 years and create seven different royalties from that same dollar of uh, original capital. That power of compounding helps drive, use the same dollar to drive an upward curve on our long-term cash flows. Um, recently, uh, had a lot of questions on, you know, how has geopolitical events globally or inflationary factors uh, affected the business? Um, it's actually affected our business positively. And uh, part of that reason is really what we're seeing uh, as a result of all these geopolitical uh, uncertainties um, is that countries across the globe, provinces, states, uh, have been looking at energy uh, security and resiliency uh, as, as a long-term strategic goal for them. This has encouraged a lot of favorable policies uh, like the Inv Inflation Reduction Act in, in the US and uh, the recent Clean uh, Technology Investment Tax Credit in Canada. So a lot of these are companies are looking to uh, bring back onshore a lot of their uh, energy security policies. And it's really a, um, encourage a higher adoption of renewables and clean tech uh, and really opened up a lot more opportunities for us on the royalty financing side. Um, in terms of inflation, uh, the inflationary uh, conditions uh, obviously have uh, resulted in a higher cost of financing uh, for ourselves as reflected in our green bonds and also for our clients. However, one of the things uh, that we're also seeing uh, by this higher cost is that some of our clients are also realizing higher revenue because there's a much higher demand for uh, renewables. Um, for certain, uh, to a certain extent, even though our green bonds has, have moved from 6% per year uh, in the last, uh, in 2021 uh, to 9% uh, uh, this year, we've been, for a certain, we've been able to pass some of that cost over to our clients and they've been able to absorb it without uh, undermining their own margins uh, and, and ours. Um, the other aspect that we've seen uh, is that because of these inflationary conditions, we've seen actually less competition. Our uh, deal flow and backlog has, uh, you know, I would say exploded and increased quite substantially in the last uh, two to three months as a result of these conditions. Uh, so here's, in terms of the deal pipeline, um, in the past year alone, uh, our team evaluated roughly about a billion dollars in opportunities. Uh, these opportunities come from existing and new clients and also various advisors that we work with uh, in the industry. Uh, approximately 20% or 200 million pass through that initial sc uh, screening stage to the second phase where we conduct more de uh, detailed uh, evaluation. So currently we are actually looking at uh, approximately 200 million in deal flow uh, that's currently in this stage. Um, the sort of uh, table on the right is a quick snapshot of the types of opportunities that we're currently seeing and where they're located. Uh, the third phase, once we get through this 200 million, uh, is we then execute a term sheet and we put terms on the tables for our clients. Um, we do uh, detailed due diligence, site visits, legal documentation, and we currently have about 40 million in this stage alone. Uh, most of this is uh, with uh, existing clients or clients that we've worked with in the past. Um, and out of this phase, historically, we've closed about 60 to 70 percent uh, uh, of this deal. Um, this backlog gives us a very strong visibility of putting our existing cash reserves to work, which will then further drive uh, our top line and bottom line.
Um, in terms of our next 12 months, our primary focus really is to deploy that remaining uh, 10 million cash on hand, and we do expect to um, complete that uh, sort of in the next month or two. Um, once deployed, we expect an annualized run rate of roughly about 9 to 10 million uh, in terms of a top line, EBITDA of roughly about 7 to 7.5. Um, in terms of funding, uh, because we do get this question given uh, uh, we do trade, is our immediate plans are really to look at potentially uh, a future green bond uh, offering uh, or co-investment partnerships with larger institutional investors uh, to get through our backlog. Uh, we have a very small team, uh, roughly about 10 people, of which uh, a third uh, is actually at the conference in person, and I think the remaining might be watching online. Um, most of our uh, uh, team members uh, have a mix of royalty, uh, engineering, renewable energy uh, type of backgrounds. I want to say that three, uh, two of the management team uh, and one of our board members are also uh, a part of uh, Canada's Clean 50 sort of annual winners, so uh, definitely have that uh, track record. Uh, and quick snapshot shot of our board members. Uh, so really, what are the key investment highlights of RE Royalties? Um, it's a very unique, high value growth and impact investment opportunity because we're deploying a really successful royalty financing model into a large and rapidly growing renewable industry. Um, we create value for investors by being a first mover using a proven business model. Number two, we provide a strong risk uh, adjusted return by investing in lower risk operational projects while securing higher development style returns. Uh, we grow our portfolio through reinvestment of capital to create new royalties. And we also protect our investment uh, uh, by employing a combination of of strategies such as being senior secured, over collateralized, and diversification. Finally, we have the right team to make this all happen. Um, I thank you for your time today in attending my presentation. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Water Tower Research and the OTC for hosting and putting together this great event. Bernard, um, we have a few minutes for questions now. Uh, any, Sean, coming right over to you. Hey Bernard, I'm wondering what what draws the the projects to you. Those is it? I mean, obviously there are huge advantages of having the royalty model for you, right, for the company and for shareholders. But what is it that gets you such uh, such a big pipeline and so many looks at uh, at investments? Um, I I think a lot of it is really sort of the unique structure. Uh, I myself come out come out of the mining royalty sort of space and. Even though most of our clients, I would sort of classify in the small to medium uh, sort of uh, enterprises uh, where capital can either be expensive and flexible and we provide that sort of flexibility. I would say we're not always the cheapest capital, but we're, we can be the most flexible to really sort of adapt uh, to uh, each of our clients sort of individual needs. At the higher sort of larger enterprise uh, sort of bracket, um, and we have had a few discussions with larger issuers. Um, part of that attraction, if you look to the similar space like the mining uh, space, um, you know, large entities like Rio Tinto, Anglo American, they still use royalty financing as part of their capital stack, uh, mainly to ensure you know they uh, don't have dilution to their shareholders or they're trying to take some money off the table to spend on higher return development projects. So uh, it's really at the same sort of uh, thesis uh, that we provide, um, you know, similar to uh, many other. Any other questions from the audience here? I believe we have some from our virtual attendees. Bernard, we have a question about dividend policy payout ratio and expectations for 2024. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I wish I could be more specific is sort of my, uh, so sort of rough numbers. Um, you know, we currently 
the four dividend generate about you know, four and a half, five million uh, in free cash that we can use for uh, dividends, buybacks, reinvestment. Um, we have a wide range of shareholders that I would say are in different camps. <laughs> so in terms of sort of dividend policy going forward, uh, you know, we're definitely in a, on a very stable front. We do not expect to change it, whether we increase it, whether we reinvest, whether we buy back, um, I think is still uh, something we are considering as, uh, uh, you know, our board is considering because it is one where, you know, where do you put the money to and where can you get your best return? So, so it's constantly under consideration, but currently we don't have any plans to change our dividend policy. And there's a question here of just about your geographical footprint and are you looking uh, to expand in any particular countries? Uh, I would say primarily most of our opportunities are still North American based. Uh, we are looking abroad. Uh, we have some partners that we do work with in the Latin and South American spheres. Uh, we've been active in Europe before, uh, although right now I would say we're currently not overly active uh, simply because uh, most of the opportunities we've high graded more towards Americas. All right, Bernard, I know you're joining us for our afternoon panel, but thank you very much for now. Thank you.
Uh, our next presentation is will be from, <clears throat> excuse me, Sunita Prasad, the Vice President in Corporate Development and IR from Revolve Renewable Power, which trades on the OTCQB market under the REVVF uh, symbol, as well as the TSXV under the RE. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, my name is Sunita, and um, I am the Vice President and uh, corporate Develop of Corporate Development and Investor Relations at Revolve. Um, today, I would uh, like to introduce Revolve Renewable Power and um, illustrate to you how it stands out in the uh, renewable energy sector. Um, secondly, I will, I will um, show you where we have been and how far we have come and where we plan on getting to. And lastly, how we are going to get there. So by the end of the presentation, uh, you will be able to see the value and the opportunity uh, with us today. Our disclaimer as a public company, we, are, we want to bring this to your attention. Our investment opportunity, uh, what we offer, um, we are an ESG-focused uh, investment opportunity. Uh, the problem we're trying to solve is net zero emissions targets. So that's our, our goal. Um, we have a diversified strategy. So we have uh, utility scale projects as well as distributed generation projects. and. Um, our management team have a proven record of success. So let's review us at a glance. Um, operator and developer. So we started off as a pure development play, and now we're transitioning to an owner operator model. Uh, we have a diverse portfolio, as I mentioned. We've uh, so the, uh, the utility scale projects. So let me explain. Um, utility scale projects are your large, uh, large projects. Uh, you know, uh, an example of this would be, uh, say, a solar farm or a wind farm. They have the capacity to provide electricity to hundreds and thousands of homes. And the distributed generation project is. Um, more commercial industrial scale projects. So these are, you know, an example of that will be your, say, a manufacturing facility that provides, uh, you know, that saves their electricity bill by installing rooftop solar. And um, we stick to proven renewable technologies, so wind, solar, and battery storage. Uh, our track record of success, uh, uh, so far, our team has developed and sold 1,550 megawatts worth of projects, uh, returning uh, close to 20 million in revenue. Uh, we would like, we are a North American focused company, so US, Canada, and uh, Mexico. And we are revenue generating. So, uh, our cur so basically, we have revenue coming through uh, the sale of uh, utility scale projects and recurring revenue from uh, producing power with our distributed generation projects. Uh, this is our uh, list of portfolio at a glance. We've got a diversified portfolio of uh, North American uh, projects that totals three gigawatts. Uh, that includes some operational projects, some projects that are under construction, and um, some that are advanced and mid-stage projects, and a, a total of 3,000 megawatts. That's our management team. Uh, Steve Dalton, our CEO, and Omar uh, Bojoquez, uh, our president, they are the co-founders of the company. And uh, Steve has over 20 years of renewable energy experience. Omar has uh, a legal background, and he is the operational. Um, uh, he, he takes care of our operational aspect. Uh, we've got uh, finance, uh, 
uh, project management, engineering, accounting, and uh, uh, legal backgrounds. So our, our track record, I want to go over how far we have come. We began, we were established in 2012 and developed and sold 300 megawatts of uh, projects. Then we expanded into the US. Uh, we went public in 2022. Uh, acquired, we uh, basically uh, added a new division to our portfolio, which was uh, a distributed generation uh, projects. And um, so, and then we developed and sold 1.25 gigawatts of uh, solar and storage project to Angie. And we also in, in, uh, expanded into Canada and we have a proposed acquisition with a Canadian uh, company, Wind River. We have a corporate strategy. Uh, so the company has transitioned from a development, more of a development play to an owner operator. And our goal is to be an independent power producer. So a large independent power producer is our goal. And, um, and how, what we're going to do by 2025, these are our, our objectives. Our revenue, we want to be at 15 million US dollars. Um, a bit of 10 and a total uh, portfolio of five gigawatts. Uh, how we are going to get there through organic growth and mergers and uh, M&A strategy. So organic growth would be uh, developing our smaller utility projects under 50 megawatts. And, and that includes uh, a couple of our projects, the Vernal battery storage project and the Primus wind project. Um, and then we plan on expanding using, you know, uh, M&A strategy. So right now we're at uh, uh, nine, nine megawatts, so operating and construction portfolio of nine megawatts. We want to be by our financial year 2024 at 59 megawatts, and that's a, 10 times increase. And from 2024 to 2025, we want to be at 189 megawatts. And the key drivers would be uh, bringing, converting our pipeline of distributed generation from, one, we've got a distributed, distributed generation portfolio of 156 megawatts. So we want to convert about 50% of that so bringing in 40 megawatts into the construction and operational stage, uh, building uh, our utility scale projects to ready to build status. And then of course, you know, acquisition of about, uh, you know, of projects that will continue every year. Our financial overview uh, revenue, this is where we were in 2022. In uh, this year, we have a revenue of 1.1 million. And by 2025, we want to be at 15 million. So you will appreciate that's an increase of 150%. Um, is that achievable? Yes, we feel that is comfortably achievable. And these numbers are based on the portfolio that we have today. We are confident in our ability to acquire uh, more projects. And when that happens, we will, our, those numbers can significantly change. So um, our target for 2025 is uh, revenue of 15 million, EBITDA of 10, and uh, operating and construction, construction assets of 150 megawatts. So now that I've talked about our value proposition, let me go over our business units. We have uh, two business units. We've got utility scale and the distributed generation pro uh, projects. So uh, utility scale projects take about three to four years to develop. Uh, 
uh, or a ready to uh, bring it to ready to build status. And the uh, shareholder value in that is the milestone payments that we get from uh, the buyer and uh, moving it from long term recurring cash that brings us long term recurring cash flow. Uh, for distributed generation is a shorter timeline, about six to nine months, and uh, we get long-term recurring uh, revenue and cash flow from that business. Uh, this is our uh, portfolio overview for utility scale projects. Uh, we have a total of 2.84 gigawatts. Out of that, uh, 633 megawatts are mid-stage and late-stage projects. Uh, our business model for utility scale project is like we take uh, projects from origination, bring it to construction ready, which we call ready to build, and project exit. And that's a three to four year pipeline. I want to go through a a scenario with you, an illustrative case, using 200 megawatt solar project. Uh, so we originate the project, bring it to construction ready, and project exit. So an investment of $2 million total uh, gives you an investment return of 8 to 10 million. And uh, industry standards are about 40,000 US dollars to uh, 50,000 US dollars per megawatt. So to uh, you know, tell you about the NG deal, that was 1,250 megawatts. So using the 40 to 50,000 US dollars per megawatt, that's about 50 to 62.5 million for us in revenue. So the two projects that we sold to NG was the Parker project and the BAUS. Uh, we so far we have received uh, two million dollars upfront and uh, eight hundred and fifty thousand uh, milestone payment. Uh, the milestone payments are based on um, for, uh, on work commitments like interconnection studies, notice to proceed, and then construction works. Uh, this is our proposed acquisition of the Canadian company Wind River. Uh, we're just waiting on a couple of things to finalize this. What it will provide us is 23 uh, megawatts of gross operating capacity, uh, 90 megawatts of gross development capacity, and it has 28 years remaining in a power purchase agreement with BC Hydro. And of course, it will provide us with revenue and cash flow. And these are projects in BC and Alberta. Uh, the BC projects are run a river project, and the Albertan project is a uh, wind project. So uh, let's go over our business model for distributed generation. Uh, so we originate the project, construct it, finance it, and then enter into a long-term power purchase agreement with our clients. And this is usually around 10, uh, over 10-year period. And uh, going over our distributed generation portfolio, we've got nine megawatts of operational and under construction projects and a pipeline of 156 megawatts. We've got, uh, our goal is to bring, convert that pipeline to operational and uh, cons under construction. But we've got uh, right now about three letters of intent signed. So we're plan on bringing those into uh, target ready to build dates of uh, you know next year 2024 um, and again I want to use an illustrative situation to uh, give you an idea of what a distribution generation uh, project would look like uh, a two megawatt battery storage uh, system would uh, provide us with uh, you know, over the uh, nine uh, the nine months we would construct uh, project origination to finance and then enter into a long-term power purchase agreement with our clients. So an, a $1 million total investment financed by the company will provide us an internal rate of return of 15% over the life of that project with an EBITDA of 180,000 annual EBITDA. So, you know, these are healthy margins.
our target market. Uh, we are we we concentrate on the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, um, especially after the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in 2022. Uh, it provided tailwinds for the renewable energy industry with all the tax credits that's available. Um, Canada followed the US and uh, Mexico for a bit. There was a lull when the new government came in, but now things are really heating up in Mexico. We have a large team on the ground in Mexico that have, uh, you know, these the distributed generation market is the fastest growing there. Uh, looking forward and what to expect. Uh, continued transition to an owner operator model. Um, we will continue to develop and sell some of the larger projects as well. Um, as far as utility scale project goes, uh, we expect for the milestone from the sale to NG. And um, uh, we want to develop the Vernal. This is our immediate uh, future Vernal and the Primus wind projects. And uh, for distributed generation, we want to convert the uh, letters of intent that we have into our operational and development. Our shareholder information, um, our issued and outstanding is at uh, 60 million. We have uh, options at uh, 50 cents, uh, 4.8 million, and we don't have any warrants. We're listed in both US and Canada. Uh, and um, management and insiders hold about 60% of the shares outstanding. So, you know, a shareholder will have confidence in the fact that management has skin in the game. You know, my clock isn't working. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, you can call me or you have anything that I can address right now. I don't know how I am for time. All right. Uh, yeah, okay. Sunita, we're still doing good on time, so okay. don't you worry. Hey, Sunita, I was wondering about the conversion of the pipeline. So what are the risks to that? I know you have to apply a certain percentage to conversion, right, to the to the pipeline. But when you go through that process and you look at your pipeline, what are the risks? Is this 100% conversion, you think, or are there certain, you know, certain aspects that you have to take into account on conversion? Um, there is always risk in anything you do. So... Um, as far as uh, conversion, we are pretty comfortable. We're just working at some due diligence and the letters of intent that signed these three, but we're working on a few more. So things are looking really good for us as far as conversion goes. Another way to ask that is the qualification to put it in your pipeline. What do you go through? What is the process you go through to say now it's in your pipeline? I we'll have to ask uh, yes. that to our technical team, but yeah, but I can get back to you on that. Yeah. Uh, Sunita, we have a couple questions about uh, future growth. So the first question is, do you see, where do you see that coming from in terms of project type, wind, solar, storage? Um, all of it. Yeah, because we are expect uh, we are doing some greenfield work in Canada as well, um, and uh, we are towards the end of closing our wind river uh, acquisition. So you know it is a, that's why we call it a proposed acquisition. But as far as projects go, um, we're concentrating on the U.S. and Canada because of the great things that's happening in the market, the renewable energy sector there. Okay. And the other question was about your growth drivers and how reliant uh, will they be on M&A or will they be more organic? I would say both because we have a lot of M&A uh, coming through and there is a lot of organic as well because we've got uh, some very good quality projects in our uh, under development. All right, Sunita, I think that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, to everyone here, we're going to have a quick lunch. Uh, we'll be having a panel starting at around 1225.